the heart of our church is that we seek to get real about the challenges of living in a broken world, that we invite the presence of God and Jesus into our everyday struggles. We don't seek to paint life other than it is, but also we are clear about the restorative power of Jesus in broken hearts. And today we've heard about some situations where God would speak to us and go before us already. And God does that too through the word of God. And the Holy Spirit comes and one of the ways he speaks to us is to convict our heart and to ask us to go further and deeper. And sometimes we are enjoying the presence of God in ways that are celebratory and other times God is pushing us in very, very hard ways very deep ways and those are the places that the power of God is needed even greater and today Jan is going to share with us an area that uh, is that order of things and I pray that you'll be in prayer for Jan as she shares it's not easy for what she's going to share um, but it's what God has said to her so this is God giving her a sense of what he wants her to say I'm going to ask Jan to come up I'm going to pray for her and then we're going to be delighted to hear from her today as she gets real about what it is to be a follower of Jesus in times of struggle. Thank you, Jan. Heavenly Father, bless Jan, we pray. We do thank you for the way that you spoke to her. We thank you for the compelling conviction she had to share today. We acknowledge that this is not easy, but we ask for your presence to be with her, for your anointing to be upon her, that you might equip her for every good word and deed, that what she says will be already planted in our hearts for good and for your glory. So bless her, we pray. Sustain her, equip her, strengthen her, I ask. In Jesus' name, amen. Yes. Hi. For those who don't know me, uh, I'm Jan, and I've been attending this church for approximately 12, 14 years. My main area of service is in children's ministry, and so you'll find me virtually every Sunday out in the creche area, as well as running play and chat on a Thursday. So I work as a self-employed accountant, hunched over a computer all day long. So you'd think I would be pretty au fait with technology, wouldn't you? No. Sadly, this is about the limit of my knowledge, and I can probably even mess that up today. So when it came time to do this little talk today, I went looking for some images to put up on the screen for you. And I wasn't quite sure what to do, so I approached Scott. And, you know, he started talking about how I could do these pictures, and he must have seen the glazed-over look in my eye. And he said, oh, Jan, Jan, just put them in a Dropbox for me. And I went, uh, Dropbox, Dropbox. Um, and, you know, the only thing that came to my mind was the long box. And, oh, sorry, the long drop. And I thought, I don't think that's the kind of box Scott's talking about. So, and didn't the school look amazing today? You, you missed him in the first service. He actually had a jacket on that match those fancy trousers, so he scrubs up pretty good. He must have got a bit of ribbing, though, because the jacket came off for this one. So I have to thank Scott very much for the um, images that are going on the screen today. I, I did go looking for them. I got them myself. Um, I went on Google. Isn't Google a wonderful thing? You go on to look at a two-minute film clip, and you come off five hours later with visions of monkeys riding on bicycles. <laughs> can waste a lot of time on there. So, anyway, I googled Mother's Day. What a variety of things that came on that screen. Hundreds and hundreds of images. Some very sweet and twee and saccharine and lovely. So, my, millions of them that said mom, M-O-M, my pet hate. And there were some vulgar things, some not very nice things. So, the internet can, uh, can play havoc. But this is the first thing that I found that resonated with me. And I'm sorry if I've now alienated half the people in this room, all the men. But John, John already referred to this in a way, so, you know. Who remembers the Golden Girls? Yeah. Four very, very strong, different characters. 
And I think each one of them embodies a different characteristic of women, and everybody here probably identifies with one of those women in some way or another. I like the old lady, the, the grandma. She used to say the most inappropriate things, which came into her head. Me, I've, I've always been a bit more filtered with what I say, so today's a bit of a surprise. So I, it, this was the closest I could get, without insulting the men too much, the closest I could get to honouring women. So for the past several years, it's been a tradition in this church to invite one of the ladies to address everybody on, Women's Day, on Mother's Day. And I've listened to various speakers tell amazing stories that I have enjoyed very much. There has been the joys of motherhood, the pain and heartbreak of broken relationships with children. I never envisaged that I would be the person to stand up and speak to you today. For I didn't think I had a story or a relevant story in me, or at least not one that I was willing to share. Now, there's another tradition in this church. It's a bit subtle. It might have missed you. You might not have noticed it, but I believe it's compulsory to make some reference to the AFL. <laughs> um, it, it is subtle. A lot of you might not have noticed that, you know. And I would be loath to let the side down, and just because I'm a mere woman, to let that go and not cover the topic. So... This is my contribution. Does, does everybody know this man? Anybody know him? Yeah, just, you'd have to be hidden under a rock not to have seen him in the last 10 years. He um, pops up everywhere. The, um, my husband even saw him on the Anzac Day service, uh, some sort of commentary, and he said, what is he doing here today? We didn't need to see him. So does anybody know his nickname? Yeah, my husband's got a lot of nicknames for him. Um, I probably can't repeat them here, but Eddie Everywhere is the one nickname that everybody knows. And I must admit, I've been starting to feel a little bit like EBC's Eddie Everywhere, because I think I've had more than my fair 15 minutes of fame up here on the platform. So I hope you'll indulge me this one last time as I talk to you about a matter that is dear to my heart. First of all, I have a confession to make. I am a glossophobe. Does any of you know what that is? Oh, you're as dumb as the first service. None of them do either. <laughs> and as dumb as me, I didn't know. I knew I was glossophobic. I just didn't know there was a term for it. So it's a fear, the biggest fear that man has. It's not even death or spiders, or heights, or flying. It is actually the fear of public speaking. Now, I know what you're saying. <laughs> yeah, you're just mocking us, Jan. You get up there at a drop of a hat. But the thing is, that's not always been me. In my earlier life, you wouldn't have got me here with wild horses. I never, ever stood up on a stage and addressed a group of people unless, in this case, I was asked to. Today, I wasn't asked. Today I volunteered, I actually emailed John and said, John, if you haven't got anybody in mind for Mother's Day, pick me, pick me. And uh, so I know that this message is not something that I felt I had to tell you, it's something that God felt I had to tell you. Because I know without a shadow of doubt that it is him who has urged me with the words that I can do all things through him who strengthens me. So now for several occasions I've stood up here to deliver a message and most have been quite light-hearted uh, so I can demonstrate that not all accountants are stuffy and lacking the funny gene. But today's not one of those. A few months ago, John introduced our theme for the year. It was mission, being on mission. And it had the three W words, and I keep forgetting some of them, but I think it was your words, your works, your ways. So I remembered them this time. And so there was one Sunday when um, I did the first service for creche instead of the second, as is my habit. And as I came through from the creche to the auditorium, I was thinking, what 
it's a bit later than usual. Church, shops are open. Church, shops are open. Mm. Fortunately, I chose church. And I came in here and John threw up this image. Or one like it. Scott found this one for me. The image of the fence. And he's used this several times during this series. You know, it's the fence that you erect at the front of your property. It looks very attractive. You invite some people in through the gate. And they can look at the facade that we present to the world that says, this is what I would like you to think I am. And a few of you will be invited into the house, into the lived-in areas of our lives that a bit of clutter, a bit of mess, looks very homely and lived in. But even fewer will be invited into the backyard where the weeds grow, where things may be a bit broken or run down that you don't let everybody look at. But yep, sometimes people will look over the fence and see what's there. I feel sorry for the little fella, isn't it? Oh. Look at him struggling. That'd be my grandson, Connor. Eh, eh, let me up. He's missing out. But So today I'm inviting you to step up onto that fence and look into my backyard. Now, I'm not doing this because I want to offer up confessions or invite sympathy or even mitigate my guilt, but purely because I think there are lessons to be learned here from my experiences that I want to share with you. Now, every Mother's Day is filled with the joy of my three wonderful adult daughters. There's Kim, my eldest, Jade, my middle daughter, and Amber, my youngest, who has given me my three adorable grandchildren. But Mother's Day is also filled with a sadness that I manage to overlook most other times, but it ambushes me on Mother's Day. For I am not a worthy mother. Every three months when I go to the blood bank and I donate blood, I have to fill out the same questionnaire, the same old questions, you know. Yes, I am still five foot nothing. I am still overweight. And then I get to that box that always makes me pause when it says, how many pregnancies have you had? And in that box, I never lie, I don't shirk it, I write five between daughter number one and daughter number two, I spent a month in hospital trying hard to avert the eventual miscarriage that I had, just short of that magical 26 weeks when the life may have been saved. It was devastating for my husband and I, but we consoled ourselves with our 18-month-old daughter and the medical opinion that this would not impact on our plans to have more children. So we went home in mourning and nobody knew what to say to us. Nobody wanted to talk about it. They wanted to pretend it didn't happen. And yet this was a momentous occasion in my life, in our life. Occasionally some would make a comment, a gratuitous comment like, oh, it's all for the best, or... It's nature's way. They meant well, but to us, it was a heartbreak. And not just because I had lost a baby I very much wanted, but because foolishly, I allowed the devil to introduce this thought into my head that God was punishing me. For you see, the remaining fifth pregnancy was in fact my first. I was 17 years old in matriculation year, year 12. I was a prefect, a straight A student, a member of several sporting teams, and the only member of my family to go to church. In fact, I was the poster girl for a wholesome, high achiever daughter of the year. I had broken up with my long-term boyfriend, you know him better as my husband John, my high school sweetheart, and so I was single and fancy free, 
and I caught the eye of the charismatic bad boy of the school. He was a boy from the wrong side of the tracks. He was rough around the edges, but he was charismatic. He had a horrendous high home life. He made me want to mother him. He was known to run away from home, to steal cars, to joyride. It made me want to reform him. He was wild and exciting. I wanted to tame him. I think you can see where this is going. Sadly, instead, at 17, I was alone and pregnant. Now, I was whisked away to Melbourne to some fancy doctor's rooms in Collins Street. And a doctor said to me, why are you here? And I couldn't say a word. I couldn't voice why I was there. Then a kindly nurse said to me, are you pregnant there? And I said, yes. And she said, don't worry, my love. We'll take care of everything. And so they did. My parents thought this was my best option. It would give me back the life they thought I was destined to live. And it did. I matriculated, I went to university, I graduated, I made up with my boyfriend, John, not the bad boy, let's be clear. I had my career, I got married, I had a family. I lived up to my parents' every expectation, but at what cost? You see, I could never erase those events from my memory. I was filled with shame and guilt and self-loathing for taking the coward's way out of that situation. I didn't like myself, and I didn't think anybody else could, including God. I never asked for his forgiveness, and I never forgave myself. Until I went to Life World Conference several years ago. And during the anointing ceremony, I was knelt in prayer and I was felt the need to confess my sin to God, to ask his forgiveness. I shed some tears, but I rose that day as if the weight of the world had been lifted from my shoulders. Now, right now, some of you are going uh, TMI, Jam, TMI, some in this service might actually know what that means. Nobody did in the last one. It means too much information, Jan. Or as Marilyn Reynolds, bless her soul, said to me, J-E-I, Jan, just enough information. Bless her soul. Some of you would say, I didn't need to know that at all. Why am I sharing my story today? Well, why didn't I keep it private? Locked away as my own guilty secret. Well, God moved me all those weeks ago to share this story, for I believe there is a message in it for all generations. So for the youngsters here today, I too was young and foolish, consumed by love that I thought was special, and my silly old parents, they wouldn't know anything about that. I didn't appreciate the significance of the fact that I was wondrously made, that I was knitted in my mother's womb, that he made me and loved me as I was his unique creation. I didn't value myself enough, and I took to people-pleasing instead. So to you I say, you are unique, you are precious. God loves you, and he respects you. So love yourselves, respect yourselves. Don't allow anyone to persuade you to do what you know is not right for you. Don't live a life of regret like I did. And for the newlyweds, the people with families, I say life will not always be easy. There will be heartbreak. There will be unmitigated joy. I now know that God did not take my baby out of vengeance. Some things are just not meant to be. 
but one in four pregnancies ends in miscarriage. It's a sad fact. There will be many here who have experienced that pain. And nowadays, with so much infertility around, there are people with the heartache of not having the baby that they want. So to you I say, trust in God and he will provide. He may not provide the baby you so desperately want, but he will give you a life, a life filled to abundance. And to those of my generation and older, my message is, judge not, lest ye be judged. It is very easy to point the finger, to gossip, to condemn. But that's not our job. Only God has the right to judge. We all fall short of glory. None of us are perfect. So statistically, I know that I'm unlikely to be the only one with this story. Um, Or a similar story, like having a child out of wedlock, or being more courageous than I, and giving your baby out for adoption to have a better life. I hope my message today hasn't opened some old wounds in you. And I know that both JB and Scott or, or Jenny or Jill would be very willing to have you talk to them and offer you some comfort. Or Lifewell has a whole range of counsellors that you could seek professional help with. So there are bro- brochures in the foyer that you can take. Please take this step towards healing. So finally, to those who feel unworthy, I don't know your particular shame, but this I do know. God loves you unconditionally, no matter what is in your past. You have a future filled with hope and love. I didn't have any input into the music today, but I thought the songs were just so appropriate. Amazing grace that saved a wretch like me and you. And the song, There is no life he cannot save. So may your Mother's Day be filled with love and no regrets. Every Mother's Day, when I gather with my three much-loved children, and my three adored grandchildren, I give a silent prayer to God for the babies that I never got to see or hold. And I ask God to care for them. I think on, you'd want me on your behalf to say thank you, Jan, for getting real and sharing with us something of deep significance to you. We, we feel enormously privileged that You have shared it with us and only before two people. So that says that we are family and uh, we will treat that with the due regard that it deserves and uh, also with the respect. Um, But we also believe that what you've said was appointed by God. You felt challenged out of a service to speak. You have spoken. We need to take notice. And there could be people here that you have shared that has allowed the thought that maybe I need to go and I'll let someone into my backyard a little bit more. Maybe there are some things that I need to allow people to look into so that I can move on to a step of wholeness and healing and restoration. And for as long as I don't allow someone into that place, I'll be captured and bound by a feeling of isolation and unresolved guilt and fear. But if I allow myself to reach into someone and disclose, then there can be acceptance and help to move on. So today, if you're in a situation where anything that Jan has spoken has sort of captured your heart a little bit or spoken to you about either something very similar uh, or another area of trapped feelings that you've never been able to let go or any other feeling where you feel you may have been failing or have fractured something and you're carrying an enormous weight of that. If there's anything like that, then may today be a moment where you can take a step forward into healing and wholeness. Now I'm going to come to a time of prayer. This prayer is particularly for anyone who may have found themselves in the situation that Jan did, where there was a termination, uh, where there was a need for a long journey of restoration. 
Uh, if that is something that is your experience today, I'm just going to ask that quietly and confidentially um, and privately to God, you pray this prayer that I'm going to pray now. And then after this, you might want to disclose to somebody in your time, when you're ready, uh, this situation. And if you did that, there are people who can help. We have qualified counsellors and I'd, we'd love to offer you a, a complimentary visit to a counsellor just to deal with that in the first moment. And then you can decide what to do from there. We'd love to help. It's an important thing to acknowledge and to move forward on. I think Jan was used by God today for that very purpose. So if this is where your situation is, your heart is, you pray these words as I pray them. As I say, this is a, a prayer for someone who has had a termination, an abortion. But this might be something for you and a great sense of loss or a great sense of guilt or shame that is upon your heart. So let us pray that God would heal. Father God, my heart feels torn apart. I do not fully understand why or how this happened to me. I still struggle with the memory of this action and at times I feel little strength left in me. And so today I come and I cry out to you for help, loving Father. In the name of Jesus, I, I cast my burden upon you and ask that you care for me. I unfold my past before you. I acknowledge it. And I ask for your perfect peace to overflow into my hurting places. Forgive me for any undisclosed actions or failures or fractures. Father, your word promises that the Lord is near those who have a broken heart. Help me bear this agony and the mental stress that comes from this and restore me your joy and your peace of mind. Father, I know that your ways are wonderful, so lead me by your spirit into deeper experiences with you and make my life a faithful one and a fruitful one. Lord, I commend every thought and every situation of mine into your loving hands. Create a clean and right spirit within me. Teach me your ways that I might teach others to obey you. Help me be one who can show others a way forward, even though the way forward may not seem clear. You tell me, Lord, not to look back but to press on, for my future is in you, so I thank you for that. I thank you for the peace that you are giving to me. Your presence goes before me. I will not fret. I will not let my heart be troubled. And this memory that I have, I ask that you renew my mind by your word, that I might see a way forward and not be gripped with this consuming thought. Thank you, Father, for being with me during these hard times and for now your assurance of joy and peace. Help me renew my mind that I might pull down any strongholds that will try to keep me from doing your will. And now, loving Father, I ask for your forgiveness. I know that when I confess my sins, you are ever faithful to cleanse me and restore me and move me on and help me not remember them anymore. And even if my heart condemns me, Father, you are greater than my heart. You are love and perfect love casts out all fear. Father, you have good things ahead for my future and you have promised to meet all of my needs. Father, for each child who has been terminated from the mother's womb, I pray that their place and presence in Jesus' heaven might be one of full blessing and full peace. And so, Father, I thank you for your presence and I thank you for your healing power. In Jesus' name, amen.